As you've probably guessed by now, I'm not Pastor Stongy. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, uh, my name's Greg Phillips. I'm a junior in the School of Divinity at Cairn University. And here at Core Creek, I'm the intern in charge of Kid Zone. Uh, so if you send your kids to Kid Zone, I've probably met them, and they've probably seen me do something zany. Uh, Pastor Stongy's away this week, so we're going to be taking a break from his series in the book of Ephesians. So if you join me today in turning to Psalms 46, let's dig into the Word of God. Hear now the Word of the Lord. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and now the proclaiming of his word. Let's pray. God, uh, we thank you that we can gather here today to learn more about you and to learn more about your word. God, we pray that anything that I say that's just me talking, that it would be quickly forgotten. That anything that I say that is of you and from you, that would be seared upon our hearts. God, we pray that everything we learn today would be profitable and that we'd be able to use it to further glorify you and glorify your name. And so we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. So as I was preparing my thoughts for this week, I got to thinking about tragedies, because that's a bit of the context of the psalm. And one of the things I find interesting is that when we face a huge crisis or a huge tragedy, we tend to remember exactly where we were when that tragedy took place. I think like 9-11 is a great example of this. Who here remembers exactly where they were when they first heard about 9-11? I, for one, I know exactly where I was during 9-11. I was inside my mom waiting to be born three months later. Know exactly where I was. So for me, 9-11 is a bit more history than memory. But... I can still definitely remember where I was during some of the tragedies in my lifetime. Um, I remember uh, my junior year of high school. It was MLK Day, and so I had off school, and like pretty much every high school student ever, I was sleeping in. I was in my bedroom when my dad came in. It was around 9 o'clock in the morning uh, when he came in to tell me the news that one of my friends had died in a car accident the night before. We remember exactly where we were in tragedy. Uh, more recently, I can remember precisely what happened on March 13th, 2020. Uh, it was 2.38 in the afternoon. I was sitting in my AP government classroom with Mr. Helms when my principal, Mr. Thornton, came on the loudspeaker. And he said that we were supposed to take everything home that we had in the school but that we were going to be coming back on Monday. But just as a precaution, take everything home, but we're coming back. Seven minutes later, as the buses are dismissing, the school board announced that we were not coming back on Monday, that we were going to be taking a one-week pause so that the teachers could get some in-service training on how to do online learning if that eventual shift happened. But we were going to come back after one week. 
I was staying after school that day, and so I was in the library when 30 minutes later, Governor Wolf announced that there was going to be a two-week shutdown of all schools in Pennsylvania. And when I walked out of the school doors that day, you know, I didn't realize that I would never go into my high school again as a student. That was the last time I'd be there physically as a student. And that I didn't realize then in my senior year that my graduation ceremony and that so many other things were going to look radically different than the way I had imagined. But I can tell you exactly what happened on March 13th. We tend to remember those moments of crisis and tragedy. And when we start to dig into Psalms 46, we find the nation of Judah dealing with crisis and tragedy. You see, uh, Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria, he had invaded the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel. And he had entirely wiped the northern kingdom out. He had carried off the ten northern tribes into exile, never to be seen again leaving the kingdom of Judah as the sole remaining Israelite kingdom. But Judah has some hope. For the king in Judah is a man named Hezekiah. And according to 2 Kings 18, Hezekiah was a good king. He tore down the high places where people sacrificed to the Canaanite gods. He broke up the idols that people were worshipping. He reinstituted worship in the temple. He reinstituted the Passover feast and the uh, ceremonial feast of Israel. He reinstituted the worship of God. You see, Hezekiah had also rebelled against Sennacherib. He had refused to pay tribute to the Assyrians. And because of this, Sennacherib moved to attack the nation of Judah. And he conquered every fortified city in the nation of Judah with the sole exception of Of Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem is under siege. They're under siege for a good long while. And as the siege is going on, Sennacherib sends his general to deliver a challenge to Hezekiah and to challenge Hezekiah's God. Uh, We find this in 2 Kings 18, verses uh, 32. Uh, to 35. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hands of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands has delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. See, the center point of Sennacherib's argument here is that the king of Assyria is greater than the God of Israel, than the God of Judah. And so he charges the city of Jerusalem saying, your God cannot protect you from me. Your God will not deliver you. What we find in scripture is that Hezekiah humbles himself and he seeks God's deliverance. In the next chapter, we get God's response to the charges of Assyria. Chapter 19, verses 32 through 35, or 36. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city or shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or cast up a siege mound against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he shall return, and he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I defend the city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And here is how God delivers the nation of Judah. And that night... The angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. 
You see, when Sennacherib challenged that he was greater than the God of Judah, the God of Judah responded. Because he is the God of Judah, and he will defend his people, and he will defend his city. And he executes judgment upon Assyria, and 185,000 of the Assyrian army dies in a single night. And it's this mighty act of deliverance that most scholars agree inspired the sons of Korah, the authors of Psalms 46, to write this psalm. And so we get to this title of the psalm, and it says uh, it's of the sons of Korah, and it's according to Alamoth, which is a Hebrew word meaning uh, maidens. So this is probably a song originally meant to be sung in the soprano range, meant to be sung by uh, female voices. The psalm overall is divided into three different stanzas or paragraphs of poetry. And so we're going to look at each one in order. So first we get to uh, the first three verses. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. So right away, we get what is, I'd say, the thesis of this psalm, which is that God is our refuge and strength. You see, when the armies of Assyria were surrounding Jerusalem, it wasn't money, nor was it an enemy nation coming in to break the siege. It wasn't any act of cunning or trickery or deception that saved the nation of Judah. Rather, it was God. God alone is mighty enough to save. He alone is strong enough to save. And so, as the psalm continues, we get then this picture that God is our very present help in trouble. And so this term very present, it means that God is with us. That when we are in trouble, God will be with us. And he's so... And it's saying that God is going to be our help. Now, when we think of this word help, I think we often think of almost an inferior kind of position. Like we think of Santa Claus and his helpers. Like Santa Claus, he's the main man. He's the head honcho. And then you have all the little elves. They're just kind of scurrying around. They're helping him, but they're not the main person. Or we think of when a small child asks to help you with something. Uh, here's me helping my dad with the bills. Um, I'm probably causing more bills than actually helping pay the bills. But that kind of help, you know, it's helping in a sense. But when you have a small child asking, you know, Dad, can I help you fix the car? Unless they're holding a flashlight, they're probably not going to be of much service. Biblically, though, this idea of help, it doesn't refer to an inferior position. Instead, this idea of help refers to something that only the helper can do. The help that is being provided is something only the helper can provide. So when God is our help, he's not showing up to wave palm fronds for Hezekiah. He's not showing up to make sure the AC is at the right temperature. He's not grabbing Hezekiah a cup of coffee. He's not formatting the PowerPoint of how Hezekiah is going to save Jerusalem. Instead, God is showing up to do something that only God can do. Showing up to provide in a way that only God can provide. And so then in verse uh, 3 or 2, We get a response to this kind of power. It says, therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear. In response to the mightiness, to the power of God, in response to his help, we should not be afraid. Because even when the earth gives way, God is still our refuge and strength. Do the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea? That's the image the psalmist is uh, constructing for us. Do the mountains are getting moved into the heart of the sea? God is still our refuge and strength. You know, when we makes, paints this picture of the mountains 
falling into the ocean, uh, I think it's important we think about Israelite geography. Because in Israel, the mountains aren't near the ocean whatsoever. The mountains are all towards the center of the country, towards the Jordan River Valley. Along the coastland, it's plains, it's very flat, almost a bit arid. And so the mountains aren't near the ocean. A couple summers ago, uh, my family and I went to Acadia up in Maine. And the big mountain on Acadia is Cadillac Mountain. And standing on top of Cadillac, like uh, in this photo here, you know, you can see the Atlantic Ocean. It's right there. And so you can imagine that, you know, if there was a big enough earthquake, you could get part of Cadillac into the Atlantic. That there would, it would be a pretty big earthquake, but you know, it's feasible. But that's just not the way it is in Israel. Only a massive cataclysm is going to send an, Isra an Israelite mountain into the ocean. They're just not near the ocean at all. And so the power that, would, uh, it, that it would take for an Israelite mountain to fall into the ocean, it's astronomical. It's apocalyptic in scale. If an Israelite mountain is falling into the ocean, the suffering and destruction that would be flowing out of the land would be almost immeasurable. It'd be unfathomable. That's the type of power that the psalmist is talking about when he says, should the mountains fall into the sea? But even though the waters roar and foam, even though the mountains are trembling and falling into the ocean, God is still our refuge and strength. And so it does not matter what kind of powers the world is throwing at us. Because our God is stronger and mightier. Our God is more powerful than any power in this world. And he will preserve his people. So after the psalm talks about all these natural disasters, these great powers... The psalm takes a turn towards the nation of Judah for the second stanza. And so, uh, second stanza is verses 4 through 7, so I'll read that now. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now when we first look at this section, we're immediately presented with an issue. Because it's talking about the city of God, this holy habitation of the Most High. And there's only one city that that can refer to. And that's the city of Jerusalem. But here's the issue. Uh, many cities uh, in ancient times and in today were built along waterways. Uh, you can think about the city of Rome and its uh, many rivers. You can think about the city of Babylon, how it's on the Euphrates. Uh, in America here, Philadelphia built on the Delaware. New York on the East River and the Hudson. Chicago's on the Great Lakes. Los Angeles is on the Pacific. You know, we build major cities near waterways because of the ease of transportation. But Jerusalem is not built on a waterway. Um, if you look at the geography around it, there's a couple small springs, but nothing that could be uh, constituting a river. So when it's saying that there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the first question we got to ask is, well, what is this river? What is the river that the psalmist are referring to? Friends, I, I think it's the river of God's grace. See, in um, Revelations uh, 21 and 22, the Apostle John is describing uh, the new Jerusalem. And it's in language that corresponds to the old. And hear this description from Revelations chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
So this is, this, John describes this water of life is flowing from God like a river. And friends, this is the river whose streams make glad the city of God. It's the river of God's grace. It's the fact that God's mercy and his grace are new every morning. They are constantly replenishing the city of Jerusalem. God's grace is replenishing Jerusalem. And friends, unlike the turbulent and cataclysmic waters of the previous stanza, the roaring and foaming waters, these are still and calm waters. They are bringing light and life to all who drink of them. And you see, this image of the river makes clear the main point of this section, which is that God is in Jerusalem. And because God is in the midst of Jerusalem, she will not fall. God will help her when the morning dawns. So you can imagine, as Sennacherib reads his challenge to the city of Jerusalem, the God who is in Jerusalem hears it. And the God who is in Jerusalem, the strong God, the mighty God, the living God, that God hears this challenge And then that God responds to this challenge. He responds in a mighty way. 185,000 of Assyria die. Because God is with the nation of Judah. God is with the city of Jerusalem. God is with his people. And so then as we come to verse 6, it doesn't matter that the nations rage. It doesn't matter that the kingdoms are tottering. Because just as we will not fear when the earth gives way, we will not fear when the nations rage. And if our God can calm the raging seas, he can calm the raging nations. And if our God is a refuge when mountains tremble, then our God is going to be a strong fortress when kingdoms totter. The earth melts before his power. So we take heart. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And there's this lovely refrain that the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And it appears in verse 7, it appears again in verse 11, and it really helps link up the different sections of the psalm. And so then we come then to our last section of the psalm, verses 8 through 11. I'll read it again here. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So the first thing the psalmist does here is he invites us to come and see the works of the Lord. And you can almost imagine Hezekiah saying this to the people of Jerusalem. Come and see. Come to the walls of Jerusalem and see what the Lord has done. Come see the Assyrian army in disarray before us. Because our God is with us and our God has delivered us. Come and see the works of the Lord. In the context of this verse, the Lord has desolated his enemies. He has ended wars. He has broken bows. He has shattered spears. He has burned chariots with fire. God has demonstrated his power and his might. So how should we respond to this? Well, it's the very next verse. Be still and know that I am God. 
Be still and know that he is God. See, it's not a call to like a quiet monastic silence where we retreat from everything and everyone and just sit in silence all day. It's not a call to cease all action and all movement. Rather, when God says to be still, he's calling us to trust in him. To trust in him in all things and in everything. To trust in God as your refuge. To trust in God as your strength. To be still and know that he is God is to rest your hope firmly in God as your fortress. And you see, because of this hope, because we have this peace, we should exalt God among all the earth and among all the nations. Because our God will be exalted among all the earth and among all the nations. Because he is God and he is powerful. He is the Lord of hosts, the God who commands armies of angels. But friends, as we seek to exalt God among all the earth, we cannot forget to exalt God in our own hearts. You see, it's tempting to try and do stuff on our own. It's tempting to make our own way and to use our own strength and to be our own refuge. But friends, what is our strength against the raging seas? Where is our refuge when the earth gives way? Can we calm the nations? Can we stabilize the kingdoms? When we lift our voices, does the earth melt? Can we in our own strength shatter spears or break bows or burn chariots? I don't know about you guys, but for me the answer is no. (laughs) You see, the help we need, the refuge we need, the strength we need is that which only God can supply. And so we exalt him among all the nations, among all the earth. And now we come to this great question of how in the world do we do this? How in the world do we exalt God? And friends, um, these are probably the two most stereotypical church answers. But they're also the true ones, and so I believe that we should do them. If you want to trust in God, if you seek to put your hope in God, read his word and pray. You see, the Lord of the universe, the God of all creation, has given us his word. If you want to hear God speak, read the Bible, read God's word. Let the words of scripture wash over you like a river of life. And dwell within God's word. And then talk to God. Take every struggle to him in prayer. Don't waste another minute of your life trying to solve your own problems. Give your problems to the Lord of hosts. For the Lord of hosts is with us. The God who created and sustains everything by his word. That God is with us. That God is our refuge. The God who created Adam in his image. That God is our strength. And the God who saved Noah from the flood. That is the God who says, be still. The God who made a covenant with Abraham. That God is our refuge. And the Lord of Isaac is with us. The God of Jacob is is our fortress. And friends, he's not just the God of Jacob. The God who is our refuge, the God who is our strength, that God is the God of Moses and of David and of Solomon and of Isaiah and Jeremiah. He's the God of Daniel and Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther. That is our God. That is our refuge. Where you see, while we were dead in our sins, that God sent his son Jesus to die And rise again for us. To provide for us that help that we could not provide ourselves. See, God, the God who is our refuge, he sent Jesus to reconcile us to him. So we could be called children of God. 
The God who sent his son to die, that God is the Lord of hosts. That God is the God who commands angel armies. That God is the God of Jacob, and that God is our fortress. And you see, friends, when we rest in him, when he is our refuge, when he is our strength, there is not a power in this universe that can ever pluck us from his hand. So, friends, if you don't know that God, you have not experienced the peace and security that flows from him, if you have not experienced the grace of God, then today would be a really good day, a really great day, to be still and know that he is God. Don't waste another day of your life without the peace of God. Friends, I wish I could tell you that trusting in God as your refuge is the guarantee for a perfect and happy life. But trusting in God as your refuge is not a guarantee that tragedy will never happen. A global pandemic cut short my senior year of high school. My friend Heath died. Tragedy stuck, struck the nation of Judah. Tragedy struck Hezekiah. But friends, with God as our refuge, we have a hope that stands secure. With God as our fortress, we will always be safe with him. Because God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in times of trouble. So do not fear. Be still and know that he is God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all the great works that you have done. And we thank you that you in your power and in your might and in your authority have time and time again rescued and delivered your people. God, we thank you that in Bible times you rescued the nation of Judah from the king of Assyria. And God, we thank you that you continue to rescue us from trouble even today. God, we pray that as we face the many trials and tribulations of life, that as we face the many harsh realities of this world, that we would always trust in who you and in who you are. And God, we thank you that in seeing how weak we were and how in need we were of your salvation, that you sent Jesus to die for us so we could be reconciled to you and that we could be with you always. God, help us to trust in Jesus' salvation. Help us to trust in his deliverance. And so God, whatever is happened in the week that was and whatever is going to happen in the week to come, we pray that we would rest in your assurance and rest in your power and rest in your deliverance. God, help us to be still and know that you are God. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.